myconids, also called fungus ones or fungus folk, are a race of mobile fungus creatures. They are known for their peaceful nature and preference for quiet, often residing in the darker areas of the world. Myconids resemble large fungi, with their height varying greatly. Their most distinctive feature is their limbs. Their upper half splits into a pair of arms below the cap, and their lower half divides into a pair of legs at each base. Each limb is short and broad, with hands that end in two stubby fingers and a thumb, and feet with several vestigial toes. The number of limbs and digits can vary, with some fungus folk having more than the usual count. Most myconids have bloated flesh and shades ranging from purple to gray, with two eyes on their caps that blend into the spongy skin when closed. Some fungus ones secrete a poisonous ooze from nearly every part of their bodies, except for their hands. A mutant strait of myconids, known as venom spores, has pale milky skin with a bright red cap. Their eyes are a sickly yellow, with the same color appearing as spots on their caps. Fungus folk are unique among the races of the Underdark for their complete avoidance of violence. A general mistrust of outsiders is common among them, shaped by their experiences with other beings. Despite this wariness, myconids are a considerate race, willing to offer shelter or allow passage through their colonies to those who approach them peacefully. A myconid's life follows a strict routine, evenly divided between sleep, work, and a practice called melding. Melding is absolutely central to myconid society, and separation from it is seen as a distressing and unfortunate fate. Violence and discord is almost unheard of in myconid communities, as these behaviors are generally seen to disrupt the melding process and are considered largely unnecessary. They show a relative innocence when it comes to ethical issues and moral dilemmas. Instead of dwelling on the past or worrying about the future, they focus on the present, enjoying the simple pleasures, and living in the moment. Although their communal way of life and absence of internal strife might suggest a collective consciousness, each myconid is in fact an individual with unique hopes, dreams, insights, fears, and personality traits. Although most of their kind are peaceful, there is a more insidious variant. Unlike the gradual growth of typical myconid communities, the variants are highly expansionist, aiming to rapidly increase both their numbers and territory. Despite the shift in behavior, they are not considered evil. Venom spores, on the other hand, are a more aggressive type of myconid. They take pleasure in combat, although they are not reckless. Their bloodthirsty nature is balanced by a strong respect for authority, and they only engage in combat when given permission by their community. Most myconids have limited physical offensive abilities, relying primarily on clasping their hands and pummeling their opponents into submission. Many can enhance their attacks by applying the poisonous effects of their bodies to their fists, causing their opponents to experience noxious pain. However, combat efficiency is not their main strength. Instead, their primary ability lay in the various specialized spores they can release, each with different effects. As myconids age, they gain access to more types and uses of these spores. The first spores to develop are distress spores, capable of spreading hundreds of feet within seconds to alert other myconids of danger either intentionally or in response to pain. Another type, rapport spores, allows myconids to telepathically communicate with other intelligent beings. As they mature, they can also release reproduction spores to create new myconids. Older myconids gain the ability to release pacification spores to daze incoming threats, though venom spores have a toxic variant that make non-myconids severely ill. Hallucination spores, primarily used in melding rituals, can also incapacitate threats. Finally, sovereign myconids have access to animator spores, a unique type that causes a purple, bulbous fungus to grow on intact corpses, reanimating them as spore servants under the command of the highest authority myconid present. This animation can last for several weeks, even affecting mostly skeletal corpses, until the body eventually disintegrates. Whether through accumulated experience or natural talent, fungus folk possess extensive knowledge about fungi, including optimal growing conditions, potential yields, and the various uses of different types. Through a mysterious bond, myconids can control a wide range of plant and fungal creatures, such as shambling mounds, phantom fungi, assassin vines, and roper-like plant monsters. The expertise in fungi extends to the Sovereign, who can perform a unique form of alchemy using various types of fungi. While this fungal alchemy can replicate the effects of standard poisons, it also allows for the creation of special effects that go beyond ordinary alchemical concoctions. If the colony anticipates a need for combat, whether for self-defense or if they're one of the more aggressive variants of myconid, they can produce special healing potions that work exclusively on fungi, 
as well as hallucinatory powder stored in spider silk to be used as a trap. In times of population shortage, they can create potions that accelerate agings, or an anointment potion that immediately, although painfully, can transform an old myconid into a king. The rarest of these special brews is a decay potion, which infects a living being with an alchemical version of animator spores, causing death within three minutes. Expansionistic myconids lack the ability to use their spores for telepathic communication, only able to convey raw emotions like fear or satisfaction, with the Sovereign being the only exception. These myconids also exhibit far greater offensive capabilities, with spines covering their fists. They are more proficient in magic than their typical counterparts, possessing a strange magical connection with each other and having specialized magic users known as Rot Priests. Rot Priests serve as both scapegoats and healers, absorbing damage from others in a colony through their connection and inflicting necrotic pain on adversaries. They have a unique relationship with positive and negative energy. Radiant energy hinders their regeneration, but upon death they release healing energy in a burst around them. Most Mykonid societies are organized into groups called circles, which are close-knit social units of about 20 members. Each circle includes four members from each Mykonid age group and is led by four circle leaders. Circle members share a deep bond as they regularly engage in melding, although melding is not usually restricted between circles. A Mykonid community typically consists of around one to ten circles, with each circle having a specific role, such as agriculture, exploration, construction, child rearing, or hunting. However, hunters in Mykonid society are more like scavengers, locating corpses to be used as fertilizer or reanimated by the sovereign. Their daily routines are strictly divided into eight-hour segments dedicated to their specialized work, melding, and sleep, with the cycle repeating every day. Circles are centered around mounds of rock, where moss is encouraged to grow, serving as both a melding area and sleeping ground, although some Mykonids live in hollow, self-healing fungal houses. Each circle is organized so that distress spores from one circle can reach at least one member of another circle, and the presence of distress spores is the only thing known to interrupt the meld. Melding combines all recreational activities, including entertainment, social interaction, worship, and meditation. A circle leader initiates a meld by using hallucinogenic spores along with small doses of rapport spores from other myconids in the circle, allowing them to experience a shared, transcendental hallucination. Every myconid community is organized by age group with a carefully controlled population. As fungus folk age, they are assigned new tasks. Sprouts, the youngest, assist their elders with daily chores and are responsible for releasing distress spores if enemies approach. Adults, aged 8 to 12, handle most of the basic work and fight alongside their superiors when danger arises. Unlike the juniors, who flee immediately, adults retreat only to set up ambushes or seek help from their elders. Elders aged 12 to 16 supervise the other Mykonids' work and attempt to engage in dialogue when faced with hostility. They typically start by addressing the strongest opponent and work their way down to neutralize all known threats. Fungus folk aged 16 to 20 usually serve as guards, protecting the circle members from harm. The oldest members of the circle become its leaders, who manage the group and advise the Mykonid king, the only figure above them. Leaders and kings prefer to direct from the rear, only entering combat if they believe their followers are in genuine danger. Being a sovereign is the most burdensome role within the Mykonid community, regarded as almost a punishment. The Mykonid sovereign must remain impartial, overseeing the circles and their duties without being part of any circle himself. This role also prohibits him from ever melding with his tribe again. The sovereign's responsibilities include creating spore servants to maintain the Mykonid's pacifistic nature, coordinating work schedules, staying vigilant against outside threats, and producing fungal brews. Sovereigns often communicate regularly with other tribes and can hold occasional meetings to discuss shared concerns, with each sovereign being familiar with the spores of most others throughout the Underdark. Normal Mykonids are buried in the gardens, while sovereigns are laid to rest beneath the mounds of a mossy rock. The mycologist Valera Krintivim believed that Mykonids had their own language. However, in reality, Mykonids completely lack any traditional language. What most people interpret as a language is actually telepathic communication made possible by their rapport spores. They do not traditionally communicate through body language or sign, considering these methods to be crude. Silophir is the benevolent deity and archfey of the Mykonid race, most recently known as the Carrion King due to his philosophy of renewal through decomposition. Despite being an enigmatic figure, even to his own people, 
Xylophere is a powerful spiritual force and the patron of all fungi. He is a unique entity, not confined to a single form. Instead, he exists in many places simultaneously, with his consciousness residing within a vast fungal root system that spans the entire Fade Arc. His presence in the Mechanus also suggests that his root system extends into other planar realms. To make a physical appearance, Silophir can quickly assume a fungoid form, manifesting before any creature or object he wishes to interact with. The Spore Lord has the ability to possess bodies in different locations at once, each of which can take on a wildly different appearance. His known forms include, but are not limited to, titanic toadstools with numerous pseudopods, morels with multiple eyes and mouths, rock-like truffles with toothy maws, giant red and white toadstools, and blue slime molds with an array of eyes and limbs. These various manifestations of the god are often enormous and are usually accompanied by a small field of fungus. Among the myconids, his most well-known form is that of a tall, levitating myconid with an extensive network of mycelia trailing behind him. In this form, his body is typically blue-gray, but can change color to blend into his surroundings or reflect his mood. Silophir is often depicted as a kind of fungal world tree, with his countless mycelia extending throughout the plains. The Carrion King's greatest desire was evident to all who knew him, to ensure the continued longevity, prosperity, and expansion of the Myconid race. While Silophir shares some of the unpredictability and danger of other Feywild lords, he differs in his lack of self-centeredness. Unlike many Archfey, he genuinely appreciates the energy and determination of short-lived mortals, viewing them as not mere playthings, pawns, or pests, but with a sense of actual fondness. Silophir's motivation for spreading the Myconids and his other adopted fungal creatures is not driven by a desire for personal glory, but rather by a commitment to their well-being. Although he was zealous about the expansion of Myconids, he can be persuaded to slow down or allow for more passive spreading, especially if it means preserving the more peaceful societies of Myconids. Silophir is admired by many for his great hospitality, showing an initial warmth and positivity towards all travelers in his realm, whether they were assassins or explorers. Despite his virtue, Silophir, the Spore Lord, is undeniably mad. The more he divides himself across various forms, the more these aspects diverge from representing his true self. While his manifested personalities are generally benevolent, they can vary greatly in behavior, from playful friendliness to quiet nobility and even ruthless objectivity. Some aspects, however, become antithetical to the desires of the whole, with rogue versions of the Carrion King being particularly dangerous. These rogue aspects, though uncommon, sometimes hold knowledge of the broader entity's plans and even adopt entirely new identities and missions. Many of these rogues believe themselves to be the true mind of the Myconid King. Silophir's core philosophy centers on the belief that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The death of individuals, whether Myconid or non-fungal, is rarely considered significant, as the values of self-sacrifice and community duty are deeply ingrained in both him and his people. The Carrion King does not place much importance on the lives of his individual aspects, as he can always conjure more when needed. In his view, death is merely a step in the creation of new life, and the dead continue to contribute to the world, never dying in vain. The Silophir who resides in Nirvana is a more meditative and peaceful entity, revered by Myconids as a wise teacher god. While his perspective on individual lives was similar, this aspect was far more contemplated, focusing on achieving perfection through patient meditation. While Silophir was not inherently violent, he was not averse to using force to achieve his goals. The Carrion King is nearly impossible to destroy, as he can almost always create new bodies. Only the rapid slaying of several of his forms in quick succession could harm his true self. Rather than engaging in direct combat, he prefers to set ambushes, accompanied by numerous plant and fungal monsters. He can fight using toxic spores, which can fire in jet streams or release in small bursts, radiating out from himself. These spores can induce a range of effects, including coughing fits, disease, poisoning, rot, sleep, hallucinations, and pacification. He has the ability to abandon his current body and reappear in the fungal growths that accompany his arrival or split his already fragmented consciousness into smaller subgroups. His fungal mass is resistant to blunt instruments, toxins, decay, water blasts, and extreme cold. Silophir can speak common, elven, and primordial, 
but he typically prefers telepathic communication. He keeps watch over the Fadar by seeing through various fungi, such as Shriekers, and his more conventional bodies can burrow underground to detect tremors caused by others. He is a knowledgeable entity, skilled in fungal alchemy and the cultivation of new fungal species. Among his creations were myconid symbionts, which bond with humanoid plant creatures like dryads, woodwodes, tree ants, and shambling mounds. These symbionts fuse with their hosts, acting as extensions of their bodies and connecting them to Silophir's spiritual and sometimes physical body. The myconids act as living limbs, can survive in sunlight, and allow the Carrion King to see through the eyes of and communicate with those who are bonded to them. Gold and gemstones hold little value for the Lord of the Myconids, though he still collects them from the deceased for use in diplomatic exchanges. Silophir's deep knowledge and connection to fungi allows him to retrieve rare specimens as gifts from others. Additionally, he can grant unique magical items as rewards, such as enchanted caps of dead sovereigns, which he can transform into helms that confer telepathic abilities and resistance to poison. Rather than ruling over a single territory, the Faelord is present throughout the entire Fade Arc, silently overseeing it from all areas, even in places where his presence might be unexpected, such as enemy strongholds. Tiny mycelia from his vast root system remain hidden and observant. In Mechanus, Silophir occupies a region known as Mycelia, where he pursues enlightenment through meditation. Rumors suggest that his influence extends into the Underdark of the Material Plane, making it difficult to determine the true reach of his root system or the extent of his influence across the various planes of existence. The majority of the Carrion King's time is devoted to the preservation and guidance of the Myconid people, with nearly all his actions aimed at furthering that goal. He undertakes tasks such as cultivating new myconid species, creating variants for a multitude of purposes. Lacking the numbers to deal with his numerous enemies directly, and with some of his resources tied up in managing his own rogue personalities, a significant portion of his time is spent on diplomacy. Silophir's approach to dealing with visitors varies depending on their reputation and skill level. Renowned trespassers are often immediately enlisted for his purposes while lesser-known entities have their abilities and personalities tested through encounters with carefully orchestrated monsters. Invited guests, or those who request an audience with him in the Fade Arc, are typically given tasks to complete, for which they are rewarded with treasures from slain intruders or specially crafted items. Silophir frequently organizes large myconid colonies to liberate enslaved fungus folk, even striving to rescue those trapped in the Shadow Dark. Silophir is a member of the Court of Stars, or he has the freedom to attend as he wishes, though he is rarely concerned with the opinions of other members. When he does participate in court gatherings, he often appears in a relatively small form, offering gifts of rare truffles while quietly listening to the discussions of the various Fey lords. The different Archfey have varying interpretations of Silophir's character, ranging from viewing him as a venerable force of Fey Dark life to considering him an ancient fungus best left in the past. He frequently recruits Fey Dark travelers to assist him and also entices Zorns with gemstones left by fallen adventurers. Different aspects of the Carrion King harbor individual ideas about their specific enemies, but a common thread in all his animosities is a deep-seated hatred for those who enslave the Myconids, leaving Silophir with countless foes. Among his recurring enemies are the Spider Queen Lolf, although the exact nature of this rivalry remains unclear. It has been speculated that a curse of insanity, originally intended for Corlon before the Dawn War, was instead redirected into the Archfey who would become the Spore Lord. Whether due to this or another reason, Myconids and Drow have never found peace within the Underdark, resulting in either mutual destruction or the enslavement of the Myconids by the Drow, fueling Silophir's enduring loathing for them. Although one might initially expect Silophir and Zugatmoy to be allies, they are in fact polar opposites. The immortal Carrion King views death as a necessary tool to renew the Earth, while Zugatmoy revels in decay for its own sake, making her and her cultists enemies of the Myconids. Zugatmoy is notorious for using her wicked spores to corrupt Silophir's children, twisting them into abyssal monstrosities bound to her dark will. The so-called last spore of Silophir, Amasutalab, was allowed to rule over a section of the Fadark because despite his bullying nature, he lacked true cruelty. Silophir's ire was particularly drawn by the Fomorians, although the exact reasons for this are not known. Other enemies include malevolent Spriggans and the Shadar Kai, who are slavers in the Shadow Dark. Not all Myconids are aware of Silophir, and some who have heard of him believe he has long since disappeared. 
It has been theorized that it was a deliberate choice by the Spore Lord, fading from places where the Mykonids no longer need him. Among his faithful are Mykonid kings on the material plane, chosen as priest kings, who regularly engage in psionic connections with him. Being one of his priests carries no additional responsibilities beyond those of a typical sovereign, and Silophir has few rituals aside from the melding process. Amid the inconsistent and enigmatic history of the Archfey, none are as mysterious as the Lord of the Mykonids, known by many names, yet virtually unheard of in the mortal realms. Silophir, or the Carrion King, had multiple origin stories that vary wildly between different iterations, adding to his mystique. Even the witch mother Baba Yaga has spoken little about what she knows of the true nature of Silophir, leaving plainer theologians to propose numerous theories about his origins. Silophir's own Mykonid children seem unaware of their progenitor's true origins, as they have little in the way of historical preservation. The title Spore Lord and the name Silophir might have been bestowed upon him by the Mykonids ages ago, but even these may not represent his true identity. Silophir himself does not remember his past clearly, as his fractured mind leaves him with poor memory, and he rarely, if ever, speaks of it. To complicate matters further, his various incarnations sometimes believe themselves to be extensions of other beings, such as Jubilex. One tale suggests that Corallon bestowed sentience upon a toadstool, which eventually grew to become the Mykonid lore. Another story posits that Lolth attempted to curse Corallon with insanity, but the spell was redirected at a pre-existing Tree Lord Archfey, who had then transformed into the Lord of Spores. Some believe that the Fomorians were responsible for Silophir's fragmented mind, corrupting him and the Mykonids into their expansionist tendencies rather than being a solitary offshoot. There are also legends that Silophir began as a god of decay, who after being killed by primordials and buried in the Feywilds, underwent a metamorphosis into the Carrion King. Others believe that he is simply a natural growth of the Feywilds, an ancient immortal who had always been present. What is known about him? is that at some point, the Mykonid Lord taught his children the secrets of fungal alchemy and guided them in cultivating new species. As they spread throughout the Feydark, whether by design or accident, some eventually made their way into the Underdark, where they lost their deep connection with the Spore Lord. The Mykonids of the Living Grotto believe that a part of their creator dwells within the petrified mushroom that serves as their great cathedral. Aramykos, known in Dwarvish as the Great Fungus, is an immense fungal growth residing in the upper north dark of the Underdark, situated beneath the high forest between the cities of Menzo Berazan and Ched Nassad. This vast organism spans almost the entire area of the Underdark beneath the high forest, beginning at a depth where light no longer penetrates and extending far deeper. It stretches from the Shining Falls to the Lost Peaks, and from the region of Tall Trees to the Hall of Four Ghosts, filling the intricate network of tunnels and caverns beneath the forest. However, by 1372, it appears to have reached its maximum size, no longer encroaching on new territories. It is described as spongy, gray, and humid, with a texture reminiscent of the surface of a brain. The area where it is located was once mined and inhabited by the dwarves of Amarindar during the era of the elven realm of Aerlon. The dwarves of ancient Amarindar recounted how their mines beneath the elven realm were gradually abandoned as Aramykos expanded, overtaking the region. Elven legends, which date back even further, suggest that the origin of Aramykos might be linked to the dark societies of the Vishantar Empire, however knowledge of that period is so scarce that even among the long-lived elves, the true origins of Aramykos remains uncertain. Some believe it is the oldest living being on Toril. Even the gods are silent on its existence, and divine attempts to uncover its nature have always failed. Many scholars contend that the creature is some kind of avatar of Silophir, whether rogue or otherwise although this theory has never been confirmed. After the Spell Plague of 1385, the rumored consciousness of Aramykos was confirmed, referring to itself as King Aramykos. It brought millions of Mykonids under its control and attempted to dominate any sentient beings within a vast distance through eerie, nightmare-like dreams. These dreams, known among the drow as the Dream Trap, spoke of the comfort of unity and the despair of individual existence, truly a nightmare for the drow. Although Aramykos nearly filled the tunnels it occupied, a few areas remained only partially covered. One of these was Blacktooth Rock, an intersection of tunnels in the ruins of Amarindar. This location was marked by large black stalactites resembling fangs piercing the fungus. The intersection is a multi-layered chamber carved by the dwarves, and is still passable but heavily infested with Aramykos. It is immune to magic and highly resistant to psionic energy. 
certain parts of the fungus can be damaged with conventional weapons or by fire, acid, and similar means, but these areas regenerate quickly. Before the spell plague, it seemed unaware of intruders and their destructive actions, although rumors suggest otherwise. The fungus possesses formidable defenses, including the ability to release poisonous gas, exert powerful psionic attacks, and manifest slimy, ooze-like creatures. It can also use spores to dominate the will of its victims and secrete substances that animate skeletal remains. Occasionally, large sections of Aramycos inexplicably wither and decay, uncovering ancient and undisturbed caverns. These caverns, sometimes housing ancient ruins, are highly sought after, particularly by the Shade Enclave. However, they are eventually reclaimed by Aramycos, whether in a matter of hours or over centuries. Scholars have debated whether the real Silophir still even exists, with some suggesting that he may have been killed by another entity of decomposition. Others believe that he is conserving his energy by using only aspects of himself to carry out his work, possibly preparing for a great metamorphosis. This uncertainty about his true state has left his followers and observers alike questioning the nature and fate of the Carrion King. Melding is seen as a form of worship for the Myconids. In times of great danger, he sends his avatars to commune with the priest kings, granting them the powers they need to address the crisis. Zuxmoy's influence can drastically alter Myconid behavior due to their fungal nature and trusting disposition, making them susceptible to corruption. By melding directly with a Myconid, Zuxmoy can infect them with madness and fervor that spreads through further melding. Those infected become enthralled by mad songs and dances, experiencing a euphoria unfamiliar to most. Over time, her abyssal influence transforms the Myconids into twisted monstrosities, resembling giant fungal maggots capable of speech and spreading their infection through special spores. Myconids are quick to suspect that flesh and blood humanoids might use violence against them. They view most of these beings as brutish and irrational, prone to conquering and destroying anything in their path, often returning to ensure their conquests remain subdued. Similarly, most humanoids regard Myconids as monsters, gripping them in with various malevolent forces in the Underdark. Since they lack useful trading goods beyond their alchemical knowledge, establishing cooperation with most other races is challenging. Population pressures further exacerbate their paranoia and distrust of outsiders. They can sometimes form bonds with spiritually peaceful and nature-loving races like the Slith, as well as their fellow fungi, the Vega Pygmy, who they see as rustic cousins. Expansionist Myconids are often cultivated or enslaved by other races, such as the Drow, Fomorians, and Shadar Kai, due to their inherent resilience. They undergo six life stages, each occurring every four years, with their lives ending sometime after they reach 24 years old. At birth, Myconid infants are the size of a normal mushroom. At this stage, they lack the ability to move and are not self-aware. By the age of four, they are known as sprouts, or junior workers, and have gained full mobility. At eight years old, they can reproduce via spores. By 12, they develop their rapport spores, and at 16, they gain the ability to use pacifying spores. At 20 years old, myconids undergo a significant increase in size and can induce hallucinatory effects as circle leaders. Those who live to the age of 24 typically become sovereigns through a special regimen. Befitting their fungal nature, they primarily act as decomposers, drawing nutrients from the ground. Their method of eating involves standing in piles of compost where their bodies absorb the useful components. Fungi that aren't cultivated for alchemical purposes are grown to eventually decay, allowing the myconids to extract the nutrients from the soil. They struggle to distinguish between softers, their term for fleshy creatures, but they can recognize other fungus folk through their spores. They prefer to live in damp, dark caverns near large bodies of water and isolated from other civilizations. The caverns they inhabit vary in size, ranging from large subterranean complexes to extensive hidden underground networks. Direct sunlight is extremely dangerous to them, with even brief exposure severely impairing them, and an hour can prove fatal. As a result, they are very reluctant to venture above ground. Myconids with a more expansive nature are known to inhabit various locations, typically preferring the Underdark or Shadow Dark, but also occupying deep dungeons, forest glades, and more unusual areas in the Feywild. They are edible and considered quite tasty by both dwarves and dwergar. In the dwergar city of Brackelstug, myconid pies are sold at Gorstaff's bakery for as much as 500 gold pieces in the late 15th century. A dwarven chef named Geldorf the Cook Tinbasher developed a recipe and craving for slow-cooked myconid soup in 1369. Additionally, Small Fry's Pantry in Skullport once served salads dusted with myconid spores. 
the true origins of the Mykonid race remain largely unknown. Their lack of language, whether written or spoken, combined with their indifference toward the past, makes it difficult for even the Mykonids themselves to understand their own beginnings. Some believe they were created by Silophir, although the Archfey himself doesn't remember. Others theorize that perhaps they emerged from Aramykos sometime in the ancient past. The death of Halastar unleashed waves of aberrant magical energy throughout Undermountain, leading to the emergence of the Venom Spore Mykonids. This magical force twisted them into distorted versions of their former selves, still loyal to their sovereigns, but now driven by a deep-seated bloodlust and equipped with poisonous spores. These Venom Spore Mykonids were first identified in Belkrum's Fall, but the true extent of the magical burst's impact is unknown, leaving the possibility open that more Mykonids were similarly affected. They are also highly expansionist, and may begin to spread throughout the Underdark. In the depths of the Fade Arc, there exists a group of Mykonids imbued with unmistakable Fey power. Tainted by Fomorian madness, these Mykonids became increasingly obsessed with spreading their influence, although they never turned completely evil. It is believed that Mykonids may have originally hailed from the Fade Arc, gradually evolving into the more peace-loving variant known to the residents of the Underdark. The Oasis of the Stone King, once a dwelling place of Drizzt Duerden, housed a small community of Mykonids. In the lower dark city of Fluvanilstra, a group of around 370 Mykonids lived under the leadership of their sovereign, Melm. Although they appeared inactive, the Mykonids occasionally controlled the city's defense force, which included shambling mounds, phantom fungi, assassin vines, and other plant-like monsters. Some Mykonid colonies are known to inhabit Aramykos, which they believe to be an avatar of Silophir. Within the Underdark, a group of approximately 150 and their spore servants resided in Neverlight Grove. However, some of them were eventually forced to evacuate to avoid being corrupted by Zugathmoy. The Feydark is home to a large population of Mykonids. Due to their aggressive growth and spread, these are considered a threat by the other denizens of the Feydark. While Mykonid colonies are typically eradicated when encountered, some Fomorian kingdoms maintain gardens of Mykonids. Notable Mykonids in Feyrunian history include King Fyrus, who was a Mykonid ruler that resided in the Mykonid caverns beneath Icewind Dale during the mid-14th century. He was aware of a party of adventurers on a mission to Menzo Berezon to rescue their town council from the drow, and recognizing their opposition to them, welcomed them as friends. Generally, King Fyrus and his subjects were unwelcoming to outsiders unless they were clearly aligned against the drow. The caverns under his rule were known for producing a rare antidote to all poisons, a valuable resource among the Mykonids and everyone else. However, Umberhulks frequently damaged the herbal patches containing the antidote, which greatly angered the king. After the adventurers defeated the Umberhulks, King Fyrus rewarded them with the fungal antidote and granted them passage through his caverns. King Philo ruled Neverlight Grove alone for many years. When the sovereign Basita and its two circles arrived in the grove, Philo was happy to have someone to share the burdens of leadership. However, two years later, when Zugadmoy arrived in the grove around 1486, she understood that the best strategy was to corrupt Philo in order to gain control of their whole community. Philo was easily corrupted and started a subtle battle of ideologies during the daily melding to convert all circle leaders to Zugatmoy. Step by step, most of the Mykonids succumbed to the madness. Only Basita and its followers resisted. Basita sought the help of a party of adventurers who had recently escaped from the drow slavers of Velk and Velve to help investigate Philo. Thanks to their assistance, Basita, along with Rasharu, Lubamub, and their other followers, they managed to abandon the grove before it was too late. Although Basita did not fully understand what had happened to Philo, or the nature of their forms taking place in the grove, it did sense that these changes were rooted in something evil, fearing that Philo had contracted some kind of disease spore. Later, Basita learned of Zugatmoy's plan to marry Aramykos, and reached out to the adventurers, who were now leading an expedition hired by Brunor Battlehammer to stop demon lords. Basita asked for their help in preventing this demonic marriage. With Basita's guidance, the adventurers were able to make contact with the mind of Aramykos and assisted in resisting the demon lord. Following this, Jubilex, who had arrived to steal Zugatmoy's prize, destroyed her physical manifestation on Toril. With Zugatmoy defeated, Basita returned to Neverlight Grove to cleanse and rebuild the area. Gasbide was a Mykonid architect and the leader of the Circle of Builders in Neverlight Grove during the late 15th century. A loyal follower of Philo, Gasbide fell under the influence of Zugatmoy, leading to his corruption. As a result, he began to dream of bizarre and elaborate structures inspired by visions of abyssal palaces, designs far beyond anything a Mykonid community would ever need. Around 1486, as Zugatmoy's influence warped most of the inner circle, Gasbide descended into madness. 
He became fascinated with buildings on the surface and harbored an ambition to construct, possibly with the aid of Aramykos, a tower taller than Igmorgus, which could potentially connect the Underdark to the surface world. Deep gnomes, known as Svirf Neblin in their own language, are a subrace of gnomes that reside in the Underdark. Unlike their surface-dwelling relatives, who are known for their endless optimism and playful nature, Svirf Neblin are serious and cautious beings. They survive in the Underdark by remaining vigilant and working diligently to keep their underground societies hidden. Deep gnomes are wiry and lean, with bodies as hard as stone. They are short in stature and light in weight. Males are completely bald and lack facial hair, while females have hair. Their complexions are often described as rough, with dark tones similar to drow or dwergar, usually showing brown or gray skin with dark eyes. Females typically have gray hair. Deep gnomes are a surly and cynical people who expect little more from life than what they currently have. They treat their own kind with respect and even goodwill, but trust is not easily extended to anyone outside their village or even outside their family. They keep to themselves, exercise extreme caution when dealing with other races, and view strangers with suspicion. Sullen and diligent, deep gnomes fully dedicate themselves to any task, typically with males focused on mining and females on keeping up their homes. While outsiders may find their overly serious demeanor unpleasant, these traits make the Sphere of Neblin tireless in their pursuit of excellence in metalworking and weapon forging. Their attitudes are partly shaped by the harsh environments they inhabit, which demand stoicism and quiet endurance for the greater good. Any loud noises or raised voices could attract danger to their homes, so they use fire sparingly for cooking and warmth. Their seriousness and pessimism only fade when they admire gems that captivate them. Despite being more serious than most gnomes, deep gnomes still exhibit the same insatiable curiosity and craftiness when the right circumstances arise. This trait, more than any other, drives some of their number to abandon their cautious upbringing and explore the world around them. Some of these wandering deep gnomes venture upwards to investigate the surface world from which their ancestors came, especially deep gnome illusionists who seek advanced instruction in the art beyond what their isolated home offers. Others become prospectors, searching the Underdark for new veins of gems and ore to mine. Deep gnomes are better suited for underground living than either rock gnomes or forest gnomes. They possess dark vision, allowing them to see in complete darkness, and have a dwarf-like connection to stone, enabling them to understand it on a level that few races can appreciate. Unlike most gnomes, they lack a natural tendency for cantrip-like abilities. However, they can blind others, obscure their presence, or shapeshift. They also possess a strong resistance to magic and can go undetected as if they were using the non-detection spell, which supplements their existing natural talent for avoiding danger and hiding. Life in the harsh conditions of the Underdark has shaped Deep Gnome society in many unique ways. Children hold significant importance in Deep Gnome communities, partly due to a low birth rate compared to the mortality rate in the Underdark. Deep Gnome couples typically have fewer than four children and rarely more than six. Mothers are devoted to their children, though not in a way that hinders their growth. When children reach adolescence, they are quickly apprenticed to masters in a trade they are expected to pursue. Adulthood is less formally defined among deep gnomes, with maturity generally recognized when a deep gnome begins working full-time in a trade. Most males work as miners or lapidaries, while females manage the household, raise children, maintain the home, gather food, and prepare meals. Deep gnomes value male and female roles equally, with males being the master outside the home and females the masters within. This principle of equal responsibility extends to their leadership structures, where each society is governed by a king and a queen who rule as equals. The king usually oversees the community's mining operations and defenses, while the queen ensures that the community has sufficient food and water and manages the daily bureaucracy. Notably, the king and queen are rarely married to each other, having come into their positions independently and being elected for life upon the death of their predecessor. Regardless of gender, deep gnomes have no true concept of retirement, continuing to work until they are physically unable to do so. Deep gnome culture is strongly influenced by the environment. Their settlements are typically centered around a large cavern, surrounded by a network of interconnecting tunnels and other caverns that make up their city. These communities are often large villages or small towns with populations of around a thousand gnomes. Usually isolated from outside contact, even from other deep gnome settlements, many inhabitants never leave their protective havens, instead choosing to stay close together for safety. Population density is high, with most families sharing a single small room as a living space where children live with their parents until they marry and start their own families. 
Spear of Neblin live in harmony with the rocks they carve and their natural surroundings. They are skillful artisans who create functional homes while preserving the natural beauty of their environment. Their expertise in mining, gem cutting, and artificing makes their handiwork highly valued by neutral merchants throughout the Underdark. They excel as guides, scouts, and foragers, possessing knowledge of underground portals, tunnels, and passages long forgotten by other races. Relying on stealth and cunning, they have mastered navigating their environment, leading to the development of some of the finest subterranean deep gnome rangers. Deep gnomes that take up adventuring typically become fighters, rangers, rogues, or wizards with a particular affinity for illusion magic. While they share other gnomes' aptitude for the arcane arts, they are equally suited to becoming rangers or rogues, having adapted to hiding and navigating the complex caverns of the Underdark. Deep gnomes with martial skills who survive their adventures and return with valuable knowledge and experience sometimes take on the role of breach gnomes, elite warriors trained to defend a position against overwhelming odds. Overall, deep gnomes are a hard-working and joyless people, but even the grumpiest deep gnome needs time to unwind. Their homes are often carved directly into the surrounding rock, with the highest ranking members of a clan usually residing in large stalagmites, while those of lower status live in the surrounding cavern floors and walls. Deep gnome cuisine also mirrors their lifestyle, with common staples including a variety of exotic fungi found only in the Underdark. Other typical foods include blind fish and occasionally roasts made from roth, goat, or mutton. Because fire produces unwanted light and smoke, deep gnomes typically salt their food instead of cooking it making most Spear of Neblin dishes nearly inedible to outsiders. For drinks, most deep gnomes enjoy a salty spirit made from fermented fish, which like their food is an acquired taste. Occasionally, they might indulge in a more potent beverage called Dogandi, rumored to contain powdered ruby and grant powerful visions to those who drink it. Artistically, deep gnomes favor the use of gemstones, which are relatively common in their communities as they mine them from the veins along which their cities are built. Deep gnomes are among the finest jewelers in the Underdark. They have also turned their mushroom cultivation into broader industries, producing fungi not only for food, but also for textiles and wood. For defense, deep gnomes often design weapons that can double as non-violent tools, with a preference for light picks, darts, and crossbows. They also use specialized weapons such as acid darts, crystal caltrops, and flash grenades. Like other gnomes, deep gnomes favor the use of illusion magic over other schools, However, while this is merely a cultural preference for rock gnomes, it's a crucial survival tactic for deep gnomes. Besides mastering the relatively simple invisibility spell, most deep gnome illusionists are well versed in ancient and forgotten lore recovered from ruins scattered throughout the Underdark. Though they rarely fully understand this knowledge, they are willing to use it in any way they can. Deep gnome wizards who are not illusionists often specialize as diviners, using their spells to locate and gather essential materials for survival. Most magical items crafted by deep gnomes are disguised as jewelry, which is relatively common among their kind. Like their surface cousins, deep gnomes worship the gnome pantheon. Although they are not considered particularly devout, clerics and other religious figures do play an important role in their society by maintaining public morale and lifting spirits despite the hardships they face. Unlike other gnomes, deep gnomes do not feel a strong connection to Garl Glittergold, who some among their kind believe favored the less serious rock and forest gnomes over them. Deep gnomes feel a much closer bond to Segojon Earthcaller, especially those who keep pets, work as rangers, or deal with domesticated animals. They also harbor a deep fear of Erdlin, whom they believe preys on the particularly greedy Sphere of Neblin by tempting them with precious jewels. This fear likely not just reflects a concern about divine intervention, but also the very real dangers of lurking in the Underdark. Despite this fear, they respect Erdlin as a reminder to stay vigilant. Among all the lords of the Golden Hills, Deep gnomes feel the strongest connection to Caladurin Smoothhands, the master of stone, whom they regard as their protector and divine benefactor. According to Spear of Neblin myths, it was Caladurin who taught them to summon and befriend earth elementals, and they honor him by incorporating the six-pointed star from his holy symbol into their art. However, it is considered taboo to include Caladurin's golden ring around the star, as that is reserved for the god himself. The deep gnomes commonly celebrate only two holidays with other festivities being created spontaneously by local priests. The Festival of the Ruby commemorates the legendary moment when Caladurin hid the rubies and other gems within the earth for the deep gnomes to discover, marking it as a day when gem hunting is believed to be particularly successful. The Festival of the Star honors the Master of Stone as a steadfast protector of the deep gnomes. During this festival, deep gnomes gather along the shores of subterranean lakes or pools to witness small, phosphorescent fungi, especially cultivated for the occasion, 
to eliminate the cavern ceilings and create a display reminiscent of a night sky reflected in the water. This event not only pays tribute to Caladurin, whose symbol features a star, but also serves as a reminder of their origins on the surface world, symbolizing that they are not alone in the dark. Deep gnome relations with other races are often constrained due to the misconception held by most surface dwellers that deep gnomes, like the Dwergar or Drow, are a cruel and vindictive branch of their surface cousins. This perception is incorrect, and while deep gnomes may be suspicious and reserved, they are generally an agreeable people. Those who do make the effort to befriend a deep gnome typically find them to have a dry sense of humor about their nature and tend to be both pragmatic and loyal. Deep gnomes are not particularly keen on correcting outsiders about these misunderstandings, and they generally prefer to be left alone. As a rule, they are deeply distrustful of other races, though they harbor a special enmity for the drow and dwergar, whose violent behavior often disrupts their desire for isolation. Deep gnomes are most accepting of gloamings and sliths, as these beings pose little threat to them. They interact very cautiously with grimlocks and orogs, as these groups are known to prey on weaker races like the deep gnomes. Orogs are large and rare species of orcs that inhabit and thrive in the Underdark. Renowned for their skills in weaponsmithing and combat abilities, they closely resemble typical mountain orcs, possessing thick necks, tusks, and snouts. However, orogs stand slightly taller than the other orc subraces, with larger ears and enormous pale eyes. Female orogs are generally smaller than males, and all orogs have taloned fingers. Compared to regular orcs, they are highly sensitive to bright light, which can not only blind and weaken them, but can also cause severe blistering of their skin. Over the years spent dwelling in the depths, Orogs developed expertise in forging weapons and armor from the unique ores found there. Possessing greater intelligence and charisma than other orc subraces, Orogs often excel in leadership roles. From a young age, nearly all of them are trained in the use of martial weapons, typically favoring great swords and throwing axes. Their weapons are often embellished with hooks, sharp edges, and spines, while their armor is adorned with spikes. They generally avoid using the more exotic weapons found in the Underdark. Orogs establish cities in the caverns using slave labor to enlarge their dwellings. These cities are typically centered around their forges, often situated near volcanic vents and magma pools. Any Orog is permitted to use the forges in their settlement. Most Orogs are literate and both fluent in Orc and Undercommon. Orogs trace their lineage to the Skullbiter tribe of mountain Orcs, who originally lived in the spine of the World Mountains. During their invasion of Netheril in negative 3605, the Skullbiter tribe and other mountain orcs were trapped between the Elven and Netherese forces, with their retreat route cut off. Seeking refuge, they fled into a narrow cave at the end of a valley, unaware that it led to the Underdark. Although lost, they felt secure from their pursuers and ventured deeper underground, eventually finding a vast jungle of luminous fungi where they chose to settle. The Orogs multiplied rapidly, spreading into the neighboring caverns and overpowering the creatures dwelling there. Over time, they divided into several tribes, discovering abundant deposits of ore. Following the collapse of the Elven Empires, Orogs began returning to the surface in significant numbers, dominating their mountain orc relatives and equipping them for battle with weapons forged from underdark metals. By 1369, a tribe of Orogs devoted to the worship of Shar had established themselves in the ruins of Mithranor. They frequently engaged in territorial disputes within the Dwarven Dungeons with the tribe of Orcs, members of the Cult of the Dragon, and a small clan of Ormir. Gloamings are a type of plain-touched being, with origins tied to both Toril and the Plane of Shadow. They have a humanoid appearance, featuring dark furred wings and pale, bioluminescent skin, which they can control to vary in brightness from completely dim to dazzlingly bright. Their eyes are often compared to those of a cat due to their oval pupils and reflected taffetum lucidum, which comes in shades of gray, green-gray, blue-gray, and violet-gray. In low light, their eyes take on a metallic hue. Fine fur covering their wings can be black, dark brown, or dark gray, with a notable sheen at the tips and base. Most gloamings bear one or more tattoos that create distinct patterns on their glowing skin. They are short in stature and very lightweight. As a group, they are known for their curiosity and take pride in their individuality, or perhaps their contrariness, since their alignment almost always differs from the dominant alignment of the region they inhabit. For instance, a chaotic evil gloaming would not be found in a chaotic evil settlement but gloamings with various other alignments might reside there. Gloamings possess several inherent abilities for low light, but are affected by light blindness in bright environments. They can fly with average maneuverability and have a minor aptitude for shadow-based illusion spells, while also being resistant to such spells cast upon them. Additionally, they are sensitive to nearby portals and exhibit significant resistance to psionics. They harbor a deep dislike for drow, 
with legends describing drow capturing, torturing, and experimenting on them. Illithids, however, find Glummings unappealing and tend to leave him alone. While uncommon in the Underdark, Glummings are almost never seen on the surface. A few settlements exist, such as the large city of Svor Upra, which straddles the boundary between the Prime Material Plane and the Plane of Shadow. Sliths are a race of humanoid shape-changers from the Underdark who are deeply committed to protecting its environment. Despite their relatively small numbers, these ooze-like beings hold considerable sway in the Underdark, influencing their surroundings throughout their long lives. In their natural state, Sliths are amorphous creatures, with a consistency somewhere between liquid and solid, resembling puddles of mud, syrup, or oil. They also have humanoid forms, appearing as bald humans with varied skin tones, most commonly brown. They are generally taller, have softer or more rounded features compared to a human. Sliths live in harmony with nature and possess a deep understanding of its principles. They view themselves as guardians of the Underdark, taking on the responsibility of helping others to interact with the world in a more balanced way. They are universally inclined toward neutral alignments, with no known members deviating from this position. They are reasonably agile, but not particularly strong, and they possess a wide array of abilities. They have resistance to sonic effects and breathe underwater, and some among them are born with a dwarf-like instinct for understanding rock, stone, and construction. The most notable ability of Sliths is their amorphous form, a boneless, nearly fluid shape they can assume. In this form, they can pass through narrow openings as small as a crack in a door, and swim as swiftly as they move on land. This shape-changing ability also grants them immunity to poisons and polymorphing effects, even when not actively using it. Shifting into or out of the form only takes a few seconds, but does require significant concentration. However, the amorphous form has several limitations. While in this state, Sliths cannot attack normally and can only maintain their form for a limited time. More experienced Sliths can hold the form longer, with the average duration being about 10 minutes and the maximum several hours. Once they revert to their humanoid shape, they must remain in that form for as long as they were amorphous before shifting again. All worn or carried items temporarily fuse with the slith during this transformation, rendering any armor or natural defenses ineffective. Magic items cease to function, supernatural powers are temporarily lost, and unless they can bypass such restrictions, spells requiring verbal, somatic, material, or focus components become unusable. They exhibit a remarkable capacity for caution, a trait unrivaled in the Underdark except by the Deep Gnomes. Many slith rely more on careful planning than on physical strength. When conflicts between other groups escalate into open hostilities, they typically refuse to take sides, opting instead to retreat to remote, hard-to-reach niches that are nearly inaccessible without their amorphous abilities. Flutter blades are considered the weapons of choice for slits. While these weapons still require martial training to use effectively, they are not regarded as particularly exotic within slith society. They rarely gather in larger groups, preferring the quiet life of small familial bands. Their families often settle in an area and become its protectors, leading many Sliths to train as druids or rangers, with a strong preference for the former. Although not every Slith becomes a druid, and some lack the aptitude for it, even commoners and warriors among them dedicate themselves to studying animal care and environmental stewardship. As Sliths mature and complete their training, they often leave their communities in search of regions where their skills are more urgently needed. Some may spend years exploring the world before finding a place where they can make a meaningful contribution. Few intelligent beings, including other Underdark races, fully grasp the more unusual abilities of the Slith. Despite this, they generally maintain good relationships with most humanoid species and are welcomed in most communities. They serve as advisors in matters of animal husbandry, agriculture, and foraging in peaceful areas, and act as mediators in regions on the brink of conflict. They have a particularly strong relationship with the Deep Orcs and Deep Gnomes, despite the former's warlike nature and the latter's deep-seated mistrust of other races. The Sphere of Neblin are especially accepting of Sliths, as they pose little threat, much like the Gloamings. Sliths share a common practice with the Sphere of Neblin of building small shrines for the Glauras, where they offer food, drink, and other tokens of gratitude. In the absence of a skilled healer, they sometimes leave the sick and dying at these shrines, hoping the Deep Fae will provide healing. Sliths harbor a strong resentment toward both Abolites and Elithids. Their animosity towards the latter is particularly intense prompting them to go out of their way to avoid Mind Flayer settlements. Sliths generally speak both common and undercommon, while many are also fluent in at least one other humanoid or elemental language. These additional languages often include Aquan or Terran, as well as the Gnome, Dwarvish, or Drow dialects of Elven. Many powerful Sliths further enhance their linguistic abilities with magical items, such as a Helm of Comprehending Languages and Reading Magic, 
or potion of tongues. Slith names often reflect their connection to nature, with first names typically imitating natural sounds of the Underdark, and surnames being compound words that combine two elements of the natural world. Sliths are deeply spiritual, often expressing this through the worship of a deity. For example, some of their kind who lean towards good may worship Shantae, while those with a more malevolent disposition might follow Shar. Sliths reside throughout the Underdark, although their population is large enough to support permanent settlements only in the Lower Dark. One such settlement is the Garden City of Fluvanilstra, while Sliths also exist in a small minority in the Kuatoa City of Sluk Dilmanpul. Sliths are considered adults at 30 years of age and reach middle age at 60. They are regarded as old at 90 and typically live up to around 160 years. In 630, a group of Slith druids, disheartened by the wasteful and destructive tendencies of many Underdark inhabitants, sought to create a tranquil space where they could study the delicate balance of nature and teach others how to foster it within the Underdark. This vision led to the founding of the city of Fluvanilstra in the Lower Dark beneath the Shar. For the first two centuries, the city functioned primarily as a monastery, but as its reputation for cultivating rare and flowering plants grew, so did the number of students. Centuries later, in 1370, Fluvanilstra was attacked, pillaged, and razed by a lost and starving horde of Darrow, who eventually departed in search of their way back home. This event taught the Sliths the importance of strong defenses. In response, they sought the assistance of a stand of myconids, bred plant creatures, including plant versions of various underdark species, and trained rangers, druids, and fungus experts to form a defensive force capable of repelling future attacks. Following this, the Sliths expanded beyond the Garden City and encouraged their students to leave and spread their teachings throughout the Underdark. These are some of the known inhabitants of Fluvanilstra. Durlu Glossa was the keeper of the Great Garden just outside the city, where plants were cultivated using soil imported from the surface world and grown on a light schedule that mimics the natural cycle above ground. Lowrider Plip Shirlush was the leader of a circle of depths, a druidic hierarchy dedicated to Sylvanus. This group, which is primarily composed of sliths, serves as the governing body of the city. Blitham is a legendary slith sorcerer and magical theorist, reputed for using his magical abilities and shape-changing powers to create remarkable items such as universal keys. Girl Deep Delver is a druid diviner who roams the deepest reaches of the Underdark, searching for the truth behind an ancient prophecy. Lyra Biltendar was a bard who served as the default guest liaison in the Flowrider's court. Lyrup is responsible for escorting guests to any individuals they request within the city, as guests are not permitted to move freely on their own. Vafush Sweetwater Lake was a good-aligned independent slith ranger, accompanied by a giant cockroach companion. She had taken on the role of protector, warden, and cataloger of the various vermin species in the Lower Dark. When forced to interact with surface dwellers, deep gnomes are most likely to find common ground with forest gnomes, who share their reclusive and withdrawn nature. They need to seek out non-gnome companions. Deep gnomes are open, though not necessarily friendly, towards gold dwarves, shield dwarves, and some of the Telkasir. Beyond these exceptions, deep gnomes generally hold a stance of distrust towards others. Those who make their living by selling gems, weapons, and metalwork to outsiders typically conduct their business in neutral caverns with numerous escape routes in case of treachery. Deep gnomes generally do not keep pets, although some keep small blind fish in bowls. They have no particular aversion to animals and often maintain herds of roth, goats, or sheep on the outskirts of their towns, taking care to keep the herds quiet and inconspicuous to avoid attracting potential attackers. They are also known to develop a fondness for small animals such as moles, shrews, bats, dire rats, or cave cans, although these are more accurately described as animal acquaintances than true pets. Deep gnomes do not live quite as long as their surface-dwelling kin, with a life expectancy just under two centuries. Due to their shorter lifespan and certain cultural practices, deep gnome children are considered adults around the age of 20. By around 1370, there were at least a dozen deep gnome towns located east of the Great Rift in southern Faerun. These towns maintained peaceful relationships with the dwarves of the Deep Realm. The Spiffneblin also were known to contribute to the mining of bloodstones in Bloodstone Mine in Damara, as they possessed the knowledge of where the most valuable deposits could be found. By 1372, the deep gnomes in this region had established a college dedicated to illusion magic. Most other Spiffneblin lived in small, isolated communities in the Underdark, carefully hidden away from the drow and other Underdark races that terrorize and subjugate them. Deep gnomes may not have always lived so far below the surface world, Evidence suggests that many human cities, such as Calanport, were built on top of abandoned gnome cities, which were later repurposed as cellars and sewers. Another example is Dolblunde, 
a gnome city northeast of Waterdeep, which indicates that the Spear of Nemblin once dwelt closer to the surface before the city was overtaken by the Draco Lich Daurgathoth. Gnome kind in general have very little in the way of historical records, and deep gnomes take this trait to its extreme. They not only lack a tradition of keeping records or writing biographies, but they also never develop a calendar or any method for tracking time. For a deep gnome, the concepts of day and night are entirely foreign, as they have never seen the light of the sun or the stars in the night sky. The cultural disregard for timekeeping is so ingrained that among outsiders, the history of the deep gnomes is usually reduced to the story of Blingdenstone, the only deep gnome settlement widely known beyond the Spear of Neblin themselves. Segajon Earthcaller is the neutral good gnome deity of earth and nature, unlike his ally, Bervon Wildwanderer, who is a god of plants and surface forests. Segojon's domain is the deep earth and the life within it. Segojon is also regarded as the gnomish god of the dead, as the gnomes lay their deceased kin to rest in his realm. His holy symbol is a glowing gemstone, often a finely cut gem imbued with illusion spells to emit a magical light. Segojon has strong ties with all the lords of the Golden Hills, except Erdolin. Beyond gnomish gods, he is most aligned with other deities associated with earth, nature, and to some degree, death. His main adversary is Erdolin as Segojon's realm is most at risk from the crawler below. His other enemies include Siric and Abathor. The well-organized Church of Segojon played a significant role in most rock gnome communities. Collaborating with the Church of Bear Von Wildwanderer, they focus on protecting and preserving the natural world, particularly beneath the Earth's surface. Together with the Church of Flandal Sealskin, they ensure the safety of mining operations, and alongside the Church of Caladurn Smoothhands, they work to build connections between deep gnome settlements in the Underdark and rock gnomes of the surface. Segojon is one of the oldest lords of the Golden Hills, and he initially governed many of the aspects of life that later became the responsibility of other deities. These included nature, mining, jewelry making, and magic. It is also believed that in ancient times, Segojon granted rock gnomes the ability to communicate with burrowing animals. Lingdenstone is a Sphere of Neblin city-state founded in negative 690 by deep gnomes fleeing the Faerim. It is situated west of the drow city of Menzo Berazon, in the upper dark beneath the Silver Marches near Mithril Hall. Like other cities, it had its own marketplace, taverns, and religious buildings. Some buildings were known to include the Trader's Grotto, a central marketplace with both temporary and permanent stalls, the Foaming Mug, a tavern named after the heraldry of the clan of Battlehammer of Mithril Hall, catering primarily to the human and dwarf travelers of the city, the House Center, the seat of power and location of the King's Court, the Speaking Stones, a sacred site of ancient menhirs around which the original city was built, sometimes referred to as an earth node. The Ruby in the Rough is a temple dedicated to Segojon Earthcaller, overseen by the head priest, Golden Gorger Suntuvik. The honored dead of the city were mummified in catacombs beneath the temple, and the head priest cared for a number of cave badgers cherished by the city's residents. The Worm Writhings is an unclaimed maze of tunnels northwest of the city, leading to Gauntelgrim, the mines of Mirabar, Dark Lake, and the Great Worm Cavern. Blingdenstone, like many deep gnome cities, was ultimately destroyed, although in a rather unusual manner. In the year of the Wanderer, 1388, King Schnichtich, the ruler of Blingdenstone, welcomed Drist de Urden, a fugitive from Menzo Berazan, into the city. Drist stayed only briefly, but his presence would have lasting consequences. Twenty years later, during the invasion of Mithril Hall in the Year of Shadows, 1358, a vengeful army from Menzo Berazan traced his route leading them near Blingdenstone. Fearing for their safety, the deep gnomes abandoned their homes and sought refuge in the surrounding darkness. After the drow army passed by, leaving the city largely intact, a group of gnome wardens, led by Belwar Disengul, persuaded King Schnichtich to lend support to Mithril Hall's defense. The victory at the Battle of Keeper's Dale saved Mithril Hall, but it came at a high cost for the deep gnomes. Twelve years later, in 1370, the matron mothers of Menzo Berazan launched a full-scale assault on Blingdenstone. The Deep Gnome's defenses proved insufficient against the Drow army, which was bolstered by demons summoned from the Abyss. Thousands of Deep Gnomes perished in the siege, and thousands more were enslaved by the vengeful Drow. Those who escaped sought refuge in Mithril Hall and Silvery Moon, where they were welcomed and eventually settled throughout the surrounding region. Two years later, Lingdenstone was inhabited by two groups coexisting with relative peace. Drow scavengers, primarily from House Duskrin, and a group of 25 Spear of Nimblin were-rats. The drow used dominated zorns to excavate the cavern floor, searching for spell gems left by the previous inhabitants to deter burrowing attackers. The were-rats occupied the maze and entrance areas of the city, but were unable to venture further due to the collapse and flooded tunnels created by the fleeing gnomes. 
They would ambush and kill small treasure-seeking parties that entered their domain, but otherwise lived peacefully within their territory. The entrance to the city featured a set of stairs and a large iron gate. Just beyond the gate was a winding maze designed to slow down potential invaders. The city's layout consists of many cavern chambers connected by twisting tunnels with an organic appearance as these structures are smoothly carved into the stone. Although many buildings appear to be simple piles of rocks, they are in fact masterfully crafted. While generally peaceful, the city was also home to Ogremox Bane, a mist of magical particles that would drive any summoned earth elemental into a destructive rage, causing havoc to anything or anyone nearby. By the late 15th century, the Spear of Neblin are known to have begun returning to reclaim their city. While Blingdenstone represents the known heights of Deep Gnome civilization, there are tales of a gnome kingdom called Asselcor, believed to exist somewhere beneath the endless ice sea above the spine of the world. Speculated to be located under the southern edge of the glacier, this hidden kingdom is said to be warmed by geothermal energy, which allows the gnomes to cultivate vast forests of fungi. The kingdom is also rumored to have rich ruby deposits, producing high-quality gems, some of which are said to be as large as a fist or even bigger. Gerdal Ironhand is a lawful good deity among the lords of the Golden Hills and serves as the patron of warriors and protectors within gnomish communities. He is revered by nearly all good-aligned gnomes, and it's common to find one or two of his crusaders in most sizable settlements. His symbol is an iron band typically worn on the left upper arm, and his favorite weapon is a warhammer called Hammersong. Gerdal resides in the Golden Hills with Dothion, which is located in Bytopia, also known as the Twin Paradises. He is known as the most stern and serious of the gnome deities. His church is organized as a strict military hierarchy. Although temples dedicated to Gerdal are rare, clerics often erect statues of him at the entrances to gnomish settlements. Priests of Gerdal offer prayers at dawn. They refer to ten days as ten hammers, a name derived from the tradition of striking a metal shield with a large hammer at the end of the day and because 10 days is the typical duration of a guard duty shift for his followers. After 10 10 hammers, the final day is celebrated as a holy day called the Great Clang, during which believers gather to sing hymns and chants. Gerdal Ironhand maintained positive relationships with most of the other gnomish gods, except for Erdlin. He has a strained relationship to Bear Von Wildwanderer due to Beardon's love of pranks. Gerdal also harbored hostility toward the pantheons of the kobolds and goblins. A few known biographies of Deep Gnomes can provide some insights into their demeanor. Wolburn Bongle lived the Deep Gnomes of Clan Ironhand in the Underdark during the late 15th century. He placed a gravestone for his father, Antonio Bungle, in the lower city graveyard of Baldur's Gate. Wolburn and Barkus Root were childhood friends, but Barkus eventually left the Underdark for the surface city of Baldur's Gate. During his time in the decrepit village, Wolburn kept a diary where he questioned whether he would ever see Barkus again. Wolbrun was a descendant of Wolverforce Bongle, who according to the book The Iron Hand Gnomes are grievances, once conversed with Gerdal Ironhand. Like his ancestors, Wolbrun harbored a deep resentment toward the Gondians, whom he believed had stolen technologies from Clan Ironhand. His animosity grew even further when the Gondians began to serve Lord Enver Gortosh, whom Wolbrun viewed as a tyrant. The book detailed the long-standing conflicts between the Iron Hand Gnomes, who were devoted to Gerdal Ironhand and the Church of Gond particularly its House of Wonder crafters and artificers. The Iron Hand Gnomes had spent generations in Baldur's Gate workshops, producing intricate and highly regarded works of artifice. Meanwhile, other city craftsmen operated crude workshops that churned out less refined imitations. However, in their generosity, the Gnomes shared their methods with outsiders. According to the tome, this led many of the Iron Hand Gnomes' inventions being wrongly attributed to the followers of the thief god Gon. Gerdal Ironhand once spoke to Wolverforce Bongle, urging him to suffer not these Gondians to steal thy livelihoods. The Iron Hand gnomes began to openly criticize the poor craftsmanship of their rivals. In response, the Church of Gond defended itself by spreading slander against the Iron Hand clan. Consumed by anger, Wolverforce Bongle eventually met his end in the unfortunate Rune Powder incident. Following this tragedy, the city and the Flaming Fist forced the Iron Hand gnomes into exile. The Iron Hand gnomes once aided Saravak Khanshev, leading to their exile from Baldur's Gate. Wolbrun was determined to restore his clan's reputation, particularly when facing criticism from the Gondians. Around the year of Three Ships Sailing, 1492, Wolbrun and the Deep Gnomes of the Iron Hand clan conducted 42 expeditions in the areas around Evan Lake, focusing primarily on working with rune powder. The decrepit village, their base of operations, was later pillaged by the Dwergars of Clan Flameshade, who served the cultists of the Absolute. 
Following this, Wolverine was captured and imprisoned in the Moonrise Towers. The ultimate fate of the prisoners held by the Cult of the Absolute is uncertain. However, rumors suggest that if Wolverine survived, he continued his resistance against Lord Fortash and the Gondians, engaging in covert actions against the Steel Watch and possibly developing an explosive made of rune powder. Trap was a young deep gnome who lived in a settlement close to the ruins of Dol Blunde during the 15th century. In the 1400s, Trap and her sister Trix gnome village was captured by a group of illithids led by the elder brain, Zufalithid. The sisters evaded capture by hiding in the nearby ruins. There, they sought the powerful Helmet of Disjunction, which was held by a traveling paladin named Jank Yendar, whom the girls referred to as the Shiny Thane. The pair received Jank by pretending to be in distress, leading him into a trap beneath a sleeping earth elemental. Though they briefly stole the helm, Jank quickly caught up with them. The sisters then appealed to Jank's sense of justice, explaining that they needed the artifact to rescue their people. Moved by their plea, Jank pledged to help them. As the paladin advanced into the Elder Brain's lair alone, Trick and Trap followed at a distance, keeping the helm of this junction secure. The paladin battled through a swarm of intellect devourers, but was soon overwhelmed by the Elder Brain's psychic attacks. In an attempt to aid him, Trick donned the helm and rushed to his side. Unfortunately, this gave Zufalithid the perfect chance to seize the artifact. The Elder Brain took the helm, and one of its Mind Flayer minions enthralled Trick. Despite the setback, Trap was determined to rescue her sister. She and Jank redoubled their efforts. While the Paladin confronted the Elder Brain again, Trap used a massive piece of mining machinery to break into the lair. With the now immortalized words of, Flay this, you slimy bowl of needles, together they penetrated Zephalithid's defenses and defeated the Elder Brain. Their combined efforts freed Trick from mental domination, and the gnome villagers were also liberated. In gratitude, Trick offered to assist Jank in hiding away the Helm of Disjunction, as he'd intended to do when he first met the sisters. Afterward, he departed for the surface world, and the two sisters joyfully reunited with their parents. Bello Built Blue Fingers was a traveling potion seller and the companion of the Mykonid alchemist known as the Concoctor. The two journeyed throughout the realms, selling their concoctions during the 14th century. Despite frequently finding himself in grim and bleak situations, Bello Gulp remained an unwavering optimist. He had a deep understanding of the communication methods used by Mykonids, which involved dispersing spores from their bloom sacks. He acted as both a salesman and mediator for the concoctor, given the Mykonid's inability to speak or understand the common language. Sometime during or before the year of the Banner 1368, Belogulp and the concoctor were captured by the eccentric drow Bela the Entertainer. They were forced to set up shop in his Black Pits gladiatorial arena located in the Underdark beneath the Sword Coast. After Baloth was overthrown by one of the spiders, Belogulp and his fungal companion managed to escape underground eventually crossing the subterranean Nepenthe River. By the following year, the duo had traveled to the eastern realm of Thay. They were captured by the planar hunters while searching for gems and potion ingredients near the underdark city of Lingdenstone. Taken to the estate of the powerful red wizard Denaton, they were once again compelled to serve as merchants in an arena, this time catering to the renowned gladiators of Thay. By the time Belogulp and his Mykonid companion had moved to Thay, the no merchant had developed an allergy to the spores they used for communication. Belwar Disengulf was a spear of Neblin from Lingdenstone, where he earned the title of Most Honorable Burrow Warden. He was a stout, barrel-chested gnome with a deep voice. After losing both his hands, his fellow deep gnomes replaced them with enchanted weapons. One arm was fitted with a pickaxe and the other with a hammer. These magical hands could be activated by an incantation following the command word Bivrip, causing the weapons to buzz with power, making them effective tools for both mining and combat. Belwar was part of a mining group near Menzo Berzan when they were ambushed by a drow patrol led by Dinan and Drizzt Doerden. All the Sphere of Neblin were killed except for Belwar, whose life was spared by Drizzt's mercy, although Dinan ordered his hands to be cut off. As a result of the incident, he gained significant respect among his fellow Deep Gnomes, although he felt uneasy with the attention. Years later, Belwar encountered Drizzt again. Drizzt, having lived in exile in the Underdark after leaving Menzo Berzan, surrendered himself to the guards of Lingdenstone, hoping to find a peaceful refuge. Belwar intervened to save Drizzt from execution, revealing that he had spared his life when he lost his hands. He offered Drizzt shelter in his home and personally vouched for his good character. Belwar then accompanied Drizzt on several adventures in the Underdark before eventually returning home. Two decades later, Drizzt returned to the Underdark, intending to surrender to the drow in Menzo Berzan to protect his friends on the surface. 
On his journey, he passed through Lingdenstone, where he and Belwar shared a brief but joyful reunion before Driz continued on his way. When his friend, worried about Driz's safety, came to the Deep Gnome territory soon after, she was taken into custody, and Belwar was tasked with questioning her. Recognizing Belwar from Driz's stories, Hattiebree managed to communicate her friendship with Driz despite the language barrier, and she learned from Belwar where he had gone. When the drow, led by Matron Bainray, launched an assault on Mithril Hall, Belwar played a crucial role in supporting the dwarves by ambushing and destroying several drow scouting parties as they passed through Blingdenstone. He also persuaded the citizens of the city to head to the surface to provide additional support to Mithril Hall. After the battle, he safely returned to his home city. Later, when Blingdenstone was attacked by the forces of Menzo Berazan, he led a group of approximately 350 refugees to the safety of Mithril Hall. In the gloom and danger of the Underdark, some like the Myconids and Deep Gnomes have taken a more peaceful approach to survival. The Myconids represent a unique approach to existence which prioritizes peace and collective well-being. Their lives revolve around a sense of community and shared purpose. Rather than engaging in conflict, Myconids rely on their spores and a communal mindset to navigate the dangers of their environment. They demonstrate harmony and cooperation can be effective strategies for survival, even in the most challenging and hostile conditions. The Deep Gnome approach to survival is marked by a strategy of caution, diligence, and self-reliance rooted in their skills in stealth and craftsmanship. They live in carefully concealed communities where every action is taken with the intent of preserving their way of life against the ever-present threats of the caverns. Their society is structured around resilience and mutual support, with each member contributing as an individual to their collective strength. These civilizations, though different in their methods, contrast heavily with the other beings of the Underdark and demonstrate that varied strategies can sustain life and society in one of the harshest environments of the Forgotten Realms.